Welcome to CodeUp's Data Scientist Day. My name is Jason Strahd. I'm the co-founder and CEO of CodeUp. To kick off this Data Scientist Day, I would like to give you a formal introduction to CodeUp. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. I'm Dimitri Antoniou, VP of Strategic Initiatives. CodeUp is a 20-week career accelerator that trains students across the entire data science pipeline. They leave the program with experience in Python, SQL, Tableau, machine learning models, and statistical analysis, plus much more. In short, they're ready to add value to your organization from day one. To kick off our presentations today, here is team Investigate Enron, a natural language processing and unsupervised machine learning project that analyzed over 500,000 Enron executive emails using topic and sentiment modeling and time series analysis. It's a fall Texas morning in 2001, and at 8.45 a.m., you walk into your workplace lobby. Your BlackBerry goes off. It's an urgent email about a mandatory company-wide meeting starting in one hour. As you proceed to the lobby and wait for your elevator, you see breaking news coverage on the TV monitors about your company. SEC investigation. Enron chief financial officer fired. Merger falls through. Enron faces bankruptcy. Wait, bankruptcy? You know your company was recently called out for failing to report financial losses, but bankruptcy? How did this happen? Who's responsible? And what does all of this mean for your company investments, your pension, and the future of your job? Hello, my name is Stephanie. And myself, along with the rest of my team, will be presenting our exploratory analysis and topic modeling project, where we use natural language processing and unsupervised machine learning on Enron employee emails to uncover insights and key takeaways that can be applied to real world use cases. First up, our agenda. I'll be introducing our project and then handing it over to my teammate Paige, who will go over our data wrangling. Next, Khan will talk about our sentiment scoring and the rest of our exploratory analysis. Rajaram will go over our topic modeling and the research we did on topics discovered. Finally, I'll close this out with a project summary. Now, a little about the subject of our project. Founded in 1985, Enron Corporation was an American energy and commodity trading company. During an era of lenient regulation and risky market speculation, it placed big bets with public utility services and hid hundreds of millions of dollars in losses using deceptive accounting practices. Enron has become synonymous with willful corporate fraud and corruption. The fallout from Enron was a key event leading to the enactment of stricter financial regulations meant to shore up accounting loopholes and restore public trust in US financial markets. Now, let's open up the project file and look at the executive summary. In determining a focus for the project, we first identify the problem we were trying to solve. How does a corporation go from being named Fortune Magazine's most innovative company for the sixth consecutive year in a row to filing one of the largest bankruptcy cases in US history later that same year, costing its shareholders $74 billion, that's billion with a B, and its employees an additional $2 billion in lost pension benefits. How can we get ahead of this kind of corporate wrongdoing and suspicious activity early and identify suspicious activity early before it causes the company to collapse? The overall goal of our project was to identify patterns in employee emails that could give us clues about what was going on within the company prior to its collapse. Initially, we believed sentiment scores would change according to key events over the timeline of Enron's collapse. What we found was that sentiment scores were relatively steady over that time. So we pivoted and looked at how we could use topic modeling to identify key themes in employee emails over time. Here, you'll find tools we used throughout the project. We used Trello for project planning and Google Slides to present our findings. We coded using Python and Jupyter Notebooks and Git for version control, pushing our notebooks to GitHub where you can find our working files and final report. For exploratory analysis, we used Matplotlib and Seaborn's visualization libraries, along with SciPy for statistical analysis. We used Python libraries for text processing and text blob and NLTK's Vader for sentiment scoring. For topic modeling, we used BERT Topic along with UMAP 
for vector simplification and model reproducibility. That's all I have for our project overview. I'll now pass it over to my teammate Paige, who will go over our data wrangling. Thanks, Tiffany. Hi, my name is Paige, and I'll be reporting about how we handled our data via wrangling for both our NLP and time series analysis. Our emails were compiled by the Kayla Project, which is sourced and made public to the web by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission during the Enron investigation. This corpus contained 500,000 plus emails with 150 unique users, mainly from senior management. Let's take a closer look at this corpus. It contained two columns, a file path and a message column, which was hard to decipher. We utilized a Python library called email, which had a parser to help us decipher the message column by setting it to an email data type. We then created four columns with date, subject, sender, and content to a list and then looping through that list and setting it and creating a data frame with the names, content, date, sender, and subject. And then moving forward, I'll briefly go over with the content prep of our emails. We began by cleaning the data by taking out extra symbols, spaces, and lowercase and characters. We then used NLTK's tokenizer for tokenizing the content. Then we removed words by using NLTK stop words. And stop words are frequently used words that carry very little meaning they're so frequent that these words get ignored by tokenizers. And then finally, we lemmatize, creating our final version of the text for computer readability. As for unique features, we wanted to use sentiment score. We created three types of sentiment scores using two algorithms from Vader and Blob Text. These scores are weighed by the intensity of emotion, opinionation, and fact-based languages. Then finally, we created a person of interest column we generated this list by viewing the congressional documents. And these are just a few of the key players that we were looking at, such as Jeff Skilling. Now let's talk about our time series preparation. We look at the distribution of our emails throughout the years. We noticed that most of our corpus had emails from 1999 and 2002, and the biggest one being in 2001. So moving forward with the time series analysis, we used those four years with our sentiment scores, which now Khan will speak more about. Thank you, Khan. Thank you, Paige. Hi, I'm Khan, and I'll be going over our exploratory analysis. It was our initial hypothesis that we would see a decline in sentiment that aligned with the collapse of Enron. Instead, what we found was that sentiment remained neutral to positive. Okay, so maybe the majority of people of Enron didn't know what was happening. So we decided to focus on persons of interest, the executives. Surely they knew what was going on. Here we see two trend lines, one for persons of interest and the other for non-persons of interest. To the left, we have intensity. To the middle, we have polarity. And to the right, subjectivity. Intensity and polarity are both emotion-based. The more words that are used that are emotional, the higher their scores. Subjectivity is opinion-based. The more words that are used that are opinionated, higher its score. So here we have intensity. And we see that both groups, persons of interest and non-persons of interest, are about the same, mostly positive. For polarity, both groups are again about the same, mostly neutral. And for subjectivity, both groups are again about the same, just slightly below neutral. These charts indicate that there are no significant differences in sentiment scores between persons of interest and non-persons of interest. We confirm this by performing two sample t-tests for each sentiment score. Okay, so we know that sentiment scores are mostly neutral to positive, but why? Why are we getting neutral to positive sentiment scores during this extremely negative situation? We believe that it's because the emails were still written in a professional manner. Here we see an email to Enron employees addressing Enron's bankruptcy filing. In it, you'll see the words are very neutral, as it should be, as a corporate and professional email. But for sentiment analysis, this negative email is just a neutral email. So then we try to find seasonality patterns. Seasonality patterns are any changes by month, year over year. So here we have all 12 months and they show their changes over the years. And even though we see three months that have significant dips, we did not find any seasonality patterns. So with sentiment scores being neutral to positive, even with persons of interest, and finding no seasonality patterns, we decided that sentiment analysis wasn't really going to help us. So instead, we used topic modeling to identify any themes that Enron employees might have talked about. 
Now, I'm going to pass it to Rajaram, who will explain our topic modeling. Thanks, Khan. Hi, I'm Rajaram, going into topic modeling. We filter our data to only look at person of interest. We further filter our data by year. Modeling with the data from 2000 and then with the data from 2001 to key in on time leading up to Enron's bankruptcy filing in December of 2001. We use bot topic modeling on our pre-processed data. Talking about how bot topic model works. Machine learning models can only process and interpret numerical data. Because we were working with text data, we had to find a way to convert email text to numerical values. Bot topics embedding features first converted the text to numerical factors so that our machine learning model could work with. Next, bot topics UMAP parameters simplified our transformed numerical values and created a random state, which allows our model to return same results every time it runs, making it reproducible. Edge BD scan then created a clusters with simplified numerical data by grouping similar values. Next, CTDIDF extracted the keywords from our cluster groups. Finally, our model output gave us a data frame comprising topic numbers with four most frequent keywords for each topic spaced by underscore. Our model also had various inbuilt visualization functions. We were able to use them to visualize the output of our model. Using bot topic, we found 149 topic clusters with each cluster containing keywords that were grouped by our model based on word similarity and word frequency. We did research on keywords that stood out to us. And one particular cluster of interest had a keywords relating to California's blackouts during the summer of 2000, caused by the energy crisis. Enron executives lined their pockets as the public utilities were deregulated and they manipulated the markets, contributing to the blackouts. With this research, we were able to connect news stories from events that were actually happening. One method of bot topic was a fine topic search features where we could actually scan all of the employee emails and find communication specific to our keywords of interest. And that's all I have for topic modeling. Now, Stephanie will close out our presentation with the conclusion. Thank you. Thanks, Rajaram. We thoroughly enjoyed this and learned so much throughout the course of this project. Enron was a company most of us were vaguely familiar with, and this project allowed us to learn even more about this story and apply natural language processing and machine learning methodologies to analyzing the raw text of the data. After researching the Enron scandal and examining our raw data, we wanted to know how we could use the corpus of employee emails to gain insights about what was going on within the company prior to its collapse and create a machine learning deliverable that could be applied to real world use cases. Initially, we thought sentiment scores would give us some clues, but after realizing that a corporation's professional tone would mute any valuable insights, we pivoted and looked at topic modeling, creating clusters of keywords that we then researched and were able to match up to real world events in the company's history leading up to its collapse. That's all for our presentation today. If you would like to learn more about our project, check out our final report and working files in our GitHub repository, linked below. Thank you for your time and attention. As you just saw, the Capstones are an end-to-end -end data science project. The teams start by identifying a problem in data set, forming a hypothesis, and determining stakeholders. Then they wrangle real messy data to analyze, model, and visualize in order to deliver their key takeaways and recommendations in these presentations. They worked on this entirely remotely as full-time data scientists, utilizing Zoom for daily scrum meetings and virtual Kanban boards. With our next capstone project, here's Team Sound the Alarm. Using data acquired from the U.S. Forest Service Research Data Archive, 
The team analyzed over 2 million wildfire records occurring across a span of 27 years. Through extensive exploratory analysis, they identified key drivers of wildfires and developed actionable solutions for reducing the devastation caused by wildfires. Hello everyone, my name is Jeanette Schultz and this is Sound the Alarm, a team project that is all about the wildfires that have happened here in the United States over the last several years. First, I'd like to introduce you to my team of data scientists, the Dames Researching Flames. Our team consists of Lori Ainsley, Christine Cabanella, Sophia Stewart, and myself. For this presentation, I'll be going over our executive summary and conclusion. Lori will then explain how we obtained and cleaned our data. Sophia will be going over key insights we learned throughout our exploration of the data. And Christine will discuss some solutions that you can help be a part of. So, why did this project spark our interest? Right now, we are facing a man-made disaster of global scale. Most of us have heard the term climate change and it's only getting worse. As the world gets warmer, our forests are getting drier. This is leading to an increase in the scale of wildfires. And as these fires get bigger, more carbon dioxide is being added to worsen climate change. It's a vicious cycle that only humanity can help interrupt. So, are you ready to help? Before we dive into the ways you can help, let's go over some of the main points of this presentation. The goal was to discover how U.S. wildfires have changed over time and see if there was a little solution to reduce their impact. We found that large wildfires are a major component of global warming and are likely to increase in the future. Our recommendation is to have more fire safety taught to the public so everyone can help stop the cycle of large forest fires. With this, our expected results would be a reduction in large wildfires that would aid in reducing climate change. Now, I'll have Lori explain how we obtained and prepared this data. Thank you, Jeanette. We downloaded our data as a SQLite database from the U.S. Department of Agriculture publication and used Pandas and Jupyter Notebooks to extract and save it to a CSV format. We then cleaned the data, did a little bit of feature engineering, and ended up with a data frame of just over 2 million wildfires that had happened in the US over the span of 27 years, from 1992 to 2018. We initially started our exploration looking into the number of wildfires. Our thinking was the less fires, the better, right? Well, it turns out that may not be entirely accurate. Things got a little more interesting when we started looking into the wildfires by size. The smallest one in our data set was only about half a square foot, and the largest one was 660,000 acres. We decided to simplify this range of sizes and classify the fires as either large or small, with those 5,000 acres or greater as our large fires, and anything less than that as small. We then wanted to see the proportion of large to small wildfires and the total area burned by each. And we're very surprised by what we discovered. If you direct your attention to the chart on the left, you'll see that the large wildfires were only a tiny proportion of our data set. And yet they dominated the smaller wildfires in total area burned. We then also looked at how this had changed over time and discovered that while the number of smaller fires is fairly sporadic over the years, we can definitely see an increase in the number of large wildfires. And this is alarming because large wildfires tend to burn very intensely and cause the most damage to the environment. While it may sound counterintuitive, fires are actually a natural and benefit natural and beneficial part of many environments, as long as they're kept at low intensity. They provide many of the benefits we have listed here, one of the primary ones being that they help clear debris from the landscape. And with climate change, we've seen an increase in the amount of this debris, which serves as fuel, helping wildfires spread quickly 
and is why we're seeing the increase in the number of large destructive wildfires. I'm now gonna pass it off to Sophia to tell us a little bit more about the causes and the different regions. Thanks, Lori. Most often, the cause of the wildfires in our data set is not documented, but of those wildfires for which we do know the cause, human influence is overwhelmingly responsible. Debris and open burning is the number one known cause of wildfires in the US. Following that, the causes of wildfires include arson, natural events, vehicle and equipment use, recreation and ceremony, power operations, and other human activities. Despite its overall ranking, natural events such as lightning cause 62% of large wildfires in the US. To get a better understanding of how wildfires differ by location, we split the United States into five different regions. The Western, Southwestern, and Southeastern regions are often prone to drought and high temperatures, so it's no surprise that this is where large fires are more likely to occur. With this in mind, I will move forward with the focus on these areas. The Western region accounts for 70% of all large wildfires in the US. On average, a large wildfire in this region burns 30,000 acres. The majority of wildfires in this region are caused by natural events. The Southwestern region accounts for 19% of large wildfires in the US. The average large Southwestern wildfire burns 22,000 acres. Most wildfires in this region are caused by debris and open burning. Although the Southeastern region only accounts for 5% of large wildfires, it does account for over a third of all wildfires in the US. On average, this region sees 31,500 fires each year, most of which are also caused by debris and open burning. That said, many of these fires are intentional controlled burns, which likely contribute to the smaller amount of large wildfires in this region. Now, I'll hand it off to Christine to talk about some of the largest wildfires. Thank you, Sophia. So I'd like to continue with some additional findings on significant wildfires we found in our data set. The first one being a wildfire named Starbuck. And no, not Starbucks coffee, just Starbuck. This fire occurred in 2017 and spans over two states, Oklahoma and Kansas, and was responsible for burning over 662,000 acres, making it the largest fire landmass in the entire US. Just so you can visualize the monstrosity of the size of this fire, just imagine the entire city of San Antonio times two. The next wildfire might hit close to home for some of you, because we'll be talking about the East Amarillo Complex fire that was discovered in Texas in 2006. This fire was not only the largest in size in all of Texas, but it's also among the most deadly. It caused 12 deaths and was responsible for almost 480,000 acres burned. This wildfire was determined to be human caused. Speaking of fires caused by humans, we want to relay the message that big or small, fire safety is for all. Since most fires are caused by human interference, you might be wondering how we as humans can do our part in reducing the amount of human caused fires. The first thing is to fully extinguish fire pits, barbecue pits, and campfires when you're done with them, and never leave an open fire unattended. Second is to report any wildfires to authorities so they can be extinguished if needed. The more time that elapses once a fire starts means more time for the fire to spread and grow larger. Next is to be aware of weather conditions, such as if it's a windy day or if the ground has been dry for a period of time. And lastly, for the sake of your vehicle and the environment, vehicle maintenance is important. Poor maintenance on your vehicle like leaky seals that extract fluid that may be flammable or broken parts can cause unwanted fires. Now I'll be passing it over to Jeanette to wrap up our presentation. Thank you, Christine. In summary, the number of wildfires has only slightly increased over the years, but the amount of destruction caused by wildfires is showing a significant upward trend. Most wildfires are caused by human negligence, which means we can stop the cycle. And lastly, open burning when done safely is an important component in keeping future wildfires small. And we encourage everyone who does open burn to do so responsibly. If you'd like to investigate this data yourself, or dive further into our research, you can find that here in our appendix. If you enjoyed our team, you can find the links to our individual projects and profiles here. And lastly, remember, only you can prevent wildfires. Thank you so much. At CODA, we don't just teach statistics, SQL, Python, and other tools. We also teach our students how to learn and approach new problems with perseverance and self-reliance. 
This is what builds adaptable professionals. They can learn to use whatever tools they have to create meaningful solutions. This adaptive expertise is often referred to as learning agility and is one of the most highly sought after traits in the tech field. As you watch our next presentation, you'll see how this group turned a problem into an innovative solution. Here's team NPR News. Using the NPR interview transcripts found on Kaggle, they've analyzed the messages delivered by NPR by measuring the sentiment and finding recurring speech patterns of their hosts. They've explored the consistency of NPR's writers and how the mood shifts with current events. With what they've found in their exploration, they've created models to decide whether a speaker is a guest or a host. Here in Texas, I'm Joanne Balraj with the NPR News Analysis Team. Today, we will be talking about how we analyze NPR media transcripts by using sentiment analysis and topic modeling. Our agenda today begins with Joshua walking through our data process and touching on expiration, followed by Brian, who will be continuing with expiration and covering topic modeling. Next, David will be discussing our modeling, and I will return for our conclusion. At the start of the project, our initial question was, does the media reflect the mood in the country? We answer this question and explore further ways to analyze trends in NPR's reporting. NPR exists to create a more informed public, so the public needs to be able to keep track of what they are listening to. The problem statement we wanted to look into was to ensure balance in content and tone. So our goals consisted of analyzing the NPR transcripts to understand sentiment and evaluating speech patterns, and to build a classification model to predict whether speech belongs to a host or a guest. Our findings were NPR's programs have a neutral sentiment and that we have a 76% accuracy rating when predicting whether a speaker is a host or a guest. Now Joshua will be guiding us through our data process. Thank you, Joanne. Following the data science pipeline, we begin by acquiring our data. The data set is found in Kaggle and contains NPR interview transcripts dating back to 1999, but due to lack of data, we cut it off at 2005. We merged two data files and formed the body of our project, which includes 3 million lines of speech. In other words, it's huge. The next step in wrangling our data was several iterations of preparation. This is when we take a dirty data frame with 3 million rows of speech data, which includes foreign languages and special characters. And with some string cleaning and feature engineering, we've narrowed our data down to our top 10 hosts and labeled whether a speaker is a host, counted how many words were spoken in what order, how many questions were asked, and the sentiment score, which is a quantitative measure of the emotional depth of the speech. A data set is now ready for exploration. First, we analyzed consistency between NPR's top hosts and found the average word count was fairly similar, showing NPR maintains consistency between their writers. While the host's word counts per episode are similar, we questioned who spoke more words overall. We analyzed our word count further and found that the guests speak more than the hosts. Conversely, the hosts ask more questions shown by the amount of question marks attributed to the hosts versus the guests. This shows NPR focuses on the guests delivering the message while the host creates the form setting found in radio. We analyzed some clusters and found that the clusters we made with our features were not useful and not used moving forward. It is possible that other combinations of features or algorithms may be more impactful. A big portion of our exploration related to the sentiment of what was said, which we rated by applying the Vader analyzer, which measures from negative one, the most negative sentiment, to one, the most positive. Directing your attention to the box plot, we notice Melissa Block stands out for having a wider range of sentiment, but on average, she maintains an overall neutral tone. While remaining neutral, we see some hosts retain some personality during their program. This is evident when examining Rachel Martin's sentiment broken up by sentences and stories, where on average the sentences are 6% brighter, while the stories are only 3% brighter. Non-hosts have a generally higher sentiment score, and this can be seen in the range of the box plot on the left compared to that of the hosts on the right. The score comparison is verified by a t-test and found different. The key takeaway is that guests have a higher average sentiment score than the hosts, who remain more neutral. And now I turn it over to Brian for further exploration. Thanks, Josh. Looking at the days of the week, we see a clear difference between work days and the weekend. Work days tend to be a little lower, but starting Friday, we see an upswing in sentiment that increases on the weekend and is sustained until Monday. We analyzed seven programs, which are ranked here by sentiment in this box plot. 
We are starting and ending the day on kind of a serious note with an upswing on the weekend and a higher score for Talk of the Nation, whose host is known for having a very friendly personality. Looking at the most common words during the different presidencies, there's a lot of talk about work, facts, and the country during the Bush and Obama presidencies, with a slight shift of focus after the election of President Trump, where his name is actually the top result. We had a look at some of the stories with a maximum sentiment rating, such as Woody Guthrie's indelible mark on American culture, and the minimum, the epidemiology of gun violence, race, region, and policy. There were many, many more stories with the max rating and only a handful with a minimum. We created a graph of overall sentiment over time, and it made us wonder what was going on during the quote unquote best of times and during the worst of times? During ups and downs, sentiment carries a weight in radio broadcasts that may influence listeners, and NPR is effective at remaining neutral at almost all times. As we analyzed our data set, we thought it would be interesting to see if there were different topics being discussed by different hosts or at different times or after certain events. This method, the method applied was latent Dirichlet allocation or LDA, which we modeled using Jensen and Spacey. This video provides a quick overview. Along the top, we have a collection of documents such as our stories, and on the left, a list of all the words in all the documents. The darker the box, the higher the frequency of a word. Shuffle things around and you get topics. For example, you can see pollution or immigration, et cetera. I ran many models with many different configurations but I found that the topics were a little hard to pin down. You kind of get a glimpse of what they were, but there's certain ambiguity. Take the highlighted topic here as an example. We'll call it foreign policy, but in reality, there are plenty of words that aren't specific to the topic. With more work, we think this could potentially be developed into another useful tool for monitoring NPR content. At this time, I'll hand the presentation over to David, who will discuss our predictive modeling. Thank you, Brian. David here, ready to talk to you about modeling, so let's dive right into it. We prepared various classification models from logistic regression to random forests with different feature configurations. Our goal with modeling was to predict whether the speaker of Align is an NPR host or not. Before talking about performance, we wanted to point out that our evaluation metric was accuracy as it is best suited for our use case, because we want to know the percentage of times we incorrectly predict whether the host of a show is an NPR host or not. To give a quick modeling overview, our target variable is whether a speaker is a host. Our baseline for this project is 63% using the mean average of who is a speaker versus who isn't one. And for performing purposes, we downsampled our data set to run on around 100,000 observations. Other features used in this model included the number of question marks in the conversation, the utterance order of the speakers, the sentiment score of each utterance, and the word count of each utterance. We implemented 15 different classification models made from different configuration of features. Some of these features included using uh, features proven for the data set, term frequency inverse document frequency, also known as TFIDF, which transforms text into a usable vector. There are two components to TFIDF. The first component identifies how often a word appears in a document, and the second component provides a measure based on how many documents a word will appear. TFIDF also provides the importance of the words. Count back tracer. Similar to term frequency, this tool is used to transform text into a vector on the basis of the occurrences of each word in the corpus. And finally, a combination of TFIDF, count back tracer, and data set features. All of our models ended up using a configuration of these previously mentioned features. However, our best performing model was the logistic regression model with count back tracer and features included. Our results were a 21% improvement over our baseline accuracy of 63% for a total accuracy of 76%. And with that, I will now let Joanne conclude our presentation. Thank you, David. We recommend our model be used as an analytical tool of news transcripts. And a stakeholder is the public writ large, which has an interest in understanding the content being broadcast by the largest nonprofit news source on the radio wave. This data set provides plenty of opportunities for exploration, including continuing exploration of the corpora, such as parts of speech analysis and so on. Another important step 
would be to use these tools to explore other media outlets as part of a broader examination of media trends in our country. If you would like to find out more about us individually, links for our profile pages are located on the corresponding app logos by our headshot. For more information, you can click on the link to the GitHub repository with all of our code, as well as a more detailed analysis of our data set as a whole. This link is located on the blue GitHub Octocat. This has been Joshua, Brian, David, and myself, Joanne, with NPR News Analysis. Thank you for listening. In our program, we don't rely solely on lecture theory and hypotheticals. Instead, we put our students to work with raw data sets of all shapes and sizes, exposing students to ambiguity, outliers, and imbalanced data. We use real, messy data so that students are prepared to clean and analyze whatever information they're given on the job. While many programs rely on theoretical knowledge and pre-clean data sets, our students have worked hands-on throughout the entire data science pipeline. Planning, acquisition, preparation, exploration, modeling, and delivery. As you watch this next group, pay special attention to how they acquired and prepared their data. Team Racket Science has taken data from the last 20 years of professionals men's tennis and explored that data to identify drivers of winning percentages. Using modern machine learning algorithms, the Racket Science team aims to predict the outcome of future matches. Like most of the world, Team Racket Science loves sports while watching and predicting the outcome. As data scientists, we believe that we can leverage machine learning techniques to help predict the victor. We have used 20 years of pre-pandemic association of tennis professional data to predict the outcome of a tennis match between two players. Now, let me introduce you to Team Racket Science. My name is Alejandro Velasquez. We have Mason Sherbondi, Daniel Norcott, and Chloe Whitaker. For today's agenda, I will give you an executive summary, a quick intro to the game of tennis, and tell you about our game plan. After me, Mason will tell you about how we acquire and prepare our data, Daniel will tell you about the exploratory work the team did, and Chloe will let you know how we defined our baseline and created our predictive model. At the end, I will discuss our conclusions with you. For our project, we established two main goals, to predict the outcome of a tennis match and find out what makes a great player. To accomplish our second goal, we focus on Roger Federer, one of the modern greats of tennis. To do so, we asked ourselves, what drives the success of a player? And is Roger Federer really one of the best of the last 20 years? In our journey, we find out that players, the top players will win a lot of their break points, will ace their opponents a lot and win their first serve points often. For our project, we follow the six steps of data science pipeline. We plan using Trello. We acquire our data using Python and GitHub. To prepare our data, we use Jupyter Notebooks, Pandas and NumPy. To learn about our data, we leverage Jupyter Notebooks with Seaborn and Maplotlib. For modeling, we use Scikit-Learn. And to deliver this presentation, we use Google Slides and Slidesco. So the game of tennis is played between two players who stand on the opposite side of the court. One serves and the other one receives. The service players will stand behind the baseline and attempt to serve the ball from the deuce half of the court to the opponent's deuce half. The ball should hit the service box on the opponent's court for the point to play out. When a serve is returned, the ball must land in the highlighted area for the game to go on. If the player who is returning the ball lets the ball bounce two times uh, before returning it, the opposite player wins the point. A tennis match is made out of sets. Sets are made out of games and games are made out of points. The goal of a game of tennis is to win more sets than your opponent in a best of three or a best of five scenario. Up next, Mason will share with you how we acquire and prepare over 100,000 rows of data. Thank you, Alejandro. To begin our wrangle, we simply clone Jeff Sackman's repository for the men's tennis tour on GitHub, a code hosting platform for version control and collaboration. After we cloned the repository, we were ready to prepare the data in our Jupyter notebooks. First, we combined all of our CSV files into one data frame. The data was larger than the format we needed, which was all the match statistics, as well as biographical information from both players, except the players were designated as winner and loser. Since our goal was to develop a model to predict the winner of tennis matches, we renamed the winner and loser columns as player one and player two, and we balanced the data set by randomizing the order of winners so that player one and player two had a similar chance of being the winner. 
We then created a Boolean mask that declared whether or not player one won the match. This was our target variable. Because the pandemic has curbed top player participation, and because we wanted our data to represent the heart of men's tennis, we limited our data to the years 1999 to 2019, and we dropped all records of players that had played less than 50 matches. Our data was now at the heart of the game. To clean the data, we renamed columns, filled missing values, and encoded categorical features for modeling. Now that our data was clean, the biggest problem we faced in preparing the data was most of our features were post-match accounts. We cannot base a pre-match prediction for a matchup based on features that are generated during the match. So since we were really looking for drivers of winning, we decided to navigate our major feature problem through feature engineering. And we decided to explore drivers of greatness as well. We set our feature focus on aggregated statistics. A feature we created for the problem was head-to-head -head stats, which is a rolling aggregate record of wins for each player matchup. And in order to explore drivers of greatness, we created a player data set based on aggregated career stats for any player in our data who achieved a rank of 100 or higher. And we focused on Roger Federer and his top rivals. This sums up our wrangling process. I will now hand you over to Daniel, who will go over our findings in this project. Thanks, Mason. I'm Daniel Northcutt, here to take you through exploration. We first asked, what attributes correctly predict a match outcome? Using exploration and statistical testing, we focused on these key features. We found there was no significant difference on height and age, height or age, and with surface type of carpet, clay, grass, and hard, only clay showed to be an indicator. Ranking points, player head-to-head -head history, and dominant hand all showed significance within our test. Beyond looking at these features to predict a match outcome, we wanted to explore what are the drivers of greatness for our players to succeed. Aggregating the stats of the 13 players that reached rank one to the 269 other players, we discovered that aces and break points per match along with first serve win percent were the primary attributes, while, the, while second serve win percent, grass and hard surface performance, and low double fall percentage served as secondary. As we put weight on these features, we concluded Roger Federer is the greatest player within this time. This discovery was being attributed to being the top three of all player attributes. We explored Federer's career and has been nothing but spectacular. Highlighting a 74% win rate against top 30 opponents and winning a total of 20 grand slams. He has had many rivalries over the years, which has produced some of the finest tennis matches of all time. Though many players have a better record on him, including Nadal with nine to three on clay, still his performance in the key metrics of greatness makes him the best player in this 20 year time span. Looking at Federer's career, we ask, can greatness be predicted at an early age? Is it natural talent or an evolution through one's career? Aggregating all players' first 50 matches, we concluded that it's extremely difficult to predetermine future champions. We found trends in predicting top 30 but with Federer and his rivals, only one of which stood out beyond the mean. Federer performed average in break points and aces while performing very low in first serve win percent, a high loss rate against ranked opponents, and a high double fault percentage. In summary, height and age play no significant difference in match outcomes. The drivers of greatness are aces, break points, and first serve win percents, and only clay showed significance in surface type. Next up is Chloe with modeling. Thanks, Daniel. Our modeling process to predict match winners is as follows. We prepared the data, created the baseline to compare our models against, created a model based on no upsets, created classification models evaluating on train and validate, and finally evaluated the best model on test. The first step is to prepare. We separated the data into X and Y, where X represents the features that drive player one to win, and Y represents the target variable that we are trying to predict, which is player one wins. Before creating our classification models, we created a baseline to compare them to based on assuming player two will win, since player two wins most often in this data set. The baseline accuracy is 51%. To improve on the baseline, we created a model based on the assumption that there will be no upsets and that the highest ranked player will win the match. This seems like a simple model, however, it will be actually tough to beat since it is based off the player's rank they got through winning tournaments and racking up rank points. The best indication we have that a player will win in the future is that they have done so consistently in the past. The accuracy for this model is 64%. 
We then built several different classification models with varying parameters using the features we identified as drivers of wind. The model that performed the best was the random forest model with an accuracy of 66% on train and 64% on validate. I'll now explain how our model works. A random forest model is made up of many decision trees. In classification modeling, the objective is to determine which class an observation fits into. To do this, a decision tree chooses the features that affect the target the most and asks true and false questions until a conclusion is reached. Many decision trees use random features and samples and make up the random forest model. After each tree has come to its conclusion, the model selects the most common outcome amongst all the trees as the final decision for the random forest model. The features that our model found to be the most important in predicting player one wins were rank difference, rank points, clay surface, and head to head for players one and two. Finally, to test our best model on unseen data, we evaluated the random forest on the test data set. Our model predicts the winner accurately 64% of the time. This is the same accuracy as our upset model, but beats our baseline by 25%. Alejandro will now wrap up the presentation with our conclusion. Thanks, Chloe. In conclusion, high rank players will beat their opponent about 64% of the times, meaning grading is tough to beat even for machine learning. Roger Feder is really a grade with a winning record of 82%. Our greatness comes from experience. In reality, age is not a key factor. With more time, we would like to engineer aggregated features by day to improve our modeling. Thank you very much, and I hope our time with you was insightful. Have a great day. From working in teams to presenting complicated data, communication skills are critical in data science. Understanding data is only half the problem. Telling the story that data represents requires an additional skill set of data storytelling. Data scientists need to effectively relay their recommendations to stakeholders. This was one of the top desired skill sets we heard from our interviews of employers, and also one of the hardest to find. Our final team is excited to share their story with you today. As part of the medical licensing exam, medical students interview standard patients and record their medical histories into clinical notes. The grading of these notes is a labor-intensive process, manually performed by physicians. This project uses natural language processing, or NLP, to extract keywords and clinical concepts. These approaches will help automate the grading process, ensure uniform score attribution, and vastly reduce the time and resources to score exams. Last but not least, here's team NLP Patient Notes. Hi, my name is Christian Freeman. My team and I are excited to present to you our project, Scoring Clinical Patients Notes Using Natural Language Processing. I had a privilege to work on this project with a fantastic team of data scientists Jared, Brent, and Scott. Here's our agenda. The USMLE, the United States Medical Licensure Exam, is designed to evaluate knowledge and clinical skills for students in medical schools. This exam is a crucial milestone for practicing medicine in the United States. It ensures the medical authority and the public that a student soon to be a doctor is competent to care for patients safely and efficiently. As part of the licensing exam, students perform a series of medical assessment on standard patient and record their medical histories. Approximately 25,000 students submit their clinical skills to be graded every year. Grading the student's notes is a tedious and time-consuming operation that instructors must do manually. Instructors, who are also physicians, spend a considerable amount of time grading clinical notes and less time to follow up with patient. The case presented in our data set has a total of 5.7 million words coming from a little over 42,000 patients notes. The average adult can read about 200 to 250 words per minute. This estimation reveals that it will take almost 16 days of nonstop reading to go through these notes. We had 10 different cases for our problem, with each case representing one patient. Each medical history has on average 13 concepts that should show up in students' notes for evaluation. The doctor grading the exam must identify the clinical concept that the student documented. This project intends to use natural language processing 
to extract keywords and attributes describing a clinical concept or condition. We are confident that this strategy would help automate the grading process, reducing the time and complexity involved in grading students' notes. I'll pass on to Jared to continue for our agenda and next steps. Natural language processing is a term describing how computers attempt to make sense of language. It falls under the realm of artificial intelligence and their machine learning and deep learning approaches to NLP. The basic process involves taking text, cleaning it up, and converting it to numbers so the computer can understand. We use those numbers to create models and evaluate them. Common steps involve breaking documents into sentences, lower casing words, and removing punctuation. Words are then stemmed or limitized, which are ways of pooling related words. With stemming, suffixes are dropped, and limitization is a more sophisticated technique that accounts for regular verb conjugations and other grammatical contexts. Here's what an original, clean, stemmed, and limitized note looked like. As I mentioned, we removed punctuation as part of cleaning. However, there are certain forms of punctuation in our notes that are essential for understanding them. For instance, there's a big difference between three to four beers and 34 beers. And pay 510 doesn't make much sense, while paying five out of 10 does. So we added hyphens and slashes back into the text. Now that our words are cleaned in process, we need to represent them numerically. One basic approach for doing so is bag of words, which is essentially just a count of word frequency. The next level of complexity for turning words into numbers is term frequency and verse document frequency. This technique also relies on word counts, but the text is subdivided into documents and the relative frequency of a word in a document is used to assign values to the words. Now that we've turned our words into numbers, we can use them to build machine learning models. For our first model, we wanted to see if we could predict which case a note belonged to based on the contents of that note. This is a trivial task for a human, but our model can do so with much higher throughput while still achieving 100% accuracy. While this approach was great for predicting which case a note belongs to, when we applied these same techniques to predict clinical condition labels from the case notes, it fell short, achieving less than 10% accuracy. Brent will now share with you some of the particular challenges and reasons why these techniques are inadequate for this task. So one of the challenges our traditional NLP model was facing were the multiple ways in which the students were documenting the clinical concepts within their notes. In this example, family history of myocardial infarction is the clinical concept found within the grading rubric and surrounding it are only some of the many ways the students were expressing this within their notes. If you draw your attention to the top left corner, dad with recent heart attack, the SIC indicates a misspelled word from the student and none of those words match exactly the words from the rubric. So the model was having a difficult time making the connections. Misspelled words are another challenge. Misspelled words become new vocabulary for an NLP model. This inaccurately increases the size of the corpus vocabulary and this introduces challenges for models that depend on word frequencies. Negations is another challenge. Without contextual awareness, the model will inaccurately attribute these clinical concepts to the patients. We need more advanced techniques in order to include contextual meaning. So this led us to our deep learning approaches, which Scott will now introduce. Thank you, Brent. The next step was to use deep learning to attempt to get context from the notes. First technology we used was GenSim to help discover the context of a word in a document. Continuous bag of words is one technique within Gensum that uses the context of surrounding words to predict the middle word. So for example, using patient reports and falling asleep to predict difficulty. Skipgram was another technology within Gensum that is used to help predict the surrounding words from the middle word. So for example, using difficulty to predict patient reports and falling asleep. Now while using TF-IDF, can compare the frequency of words, it gives us limited information. However, using Jensen's word to vec, we are able to contextualize a word in a sentence and therefore gather much more information. Whether using a pre-trained Jensen model trained on Google News, seen here on the left, or training on our corpus, seen here on the right, 
useful but different information is returned. There are different ways the pre-trained model versus our corpus discover similarities between words. For example, the pre-trained model finds similarities between nausea and dizziness, vomiting, and constipation, and our corpus finds similarities between nausea and different misspellings of the word nausea. This helps in understanding the different ways students might express a clinical concept. The next technology we used was Spacey to help locate specific concepts in the notes. So some challenges we faced with Spacey is that it did not recognize clinical terms and some topics were misclassified. In this example, SH in the bottom right corner is classified as an organization. However, SH in this context can mean sexual history or social history. The next technology that we used was SciSpacy, which is just like Spacey, except it's trained on biomedical data. It was much more successful at locating the clinical concepts within the student notes. So for example, it found heart pounding, dyspnea, chest pain, and Adderall. Next, you'll hear from Brent to discuss another deep learning approach. Thank you, Scott. Another deep learning approach we took was to create a multi-label text classification model using TensorFlow and Keras. Before sending the data through our model, we had to pre-process the text first. So we created a single list of all of the clinical concepts found within the grading rubric. These became the labels that our model will predict. We then separated the labels into sets, each set corresponding to its respective case. We then created a binary representation of each set of labels. And once we had these binarized set of labels, we created a TensorFlow data set consisting of all of the raw text from the student notes along with its respective binarized set of labels. We ran it through a text vectorization layer which represented the text as numbers and then sent that through our sequential model which consisted of three layers and that model returns a ranking of the labels that it predicts to be found within the student notes. Currently, our model is able to predict the proper clinical concepts found within the student notes 40% of the time. And now Scott will finish the presentation with our conclusions and next steps. Thank you, Brent. In conclusion, while classical NLP approaches work well for certain simple tasks, it is not as effective for more complex tasks. Each of these deep learning approaches add different useful information, but none alone entirely solves the problem. Therefore, an ensemble of deep learning methods will likely get us closer to our goal of automating the grading process. We've enjoyed sharing our presentation with you. If you are curious to learn more, please reach out via email, GitHub, or LinkedIn. On behalf of the entire team here at MDAI, thank you for your time and attention. And there you have it. That concludes today's data science capstone presentations. Thank you to everyone for joining us. If you're an employer that's ready to hire a data scientist, data engineer, data analyst, trained in the most in-demand skills, head over to alumni.codup.com to find resumes and contact information of these fantastic graduates, or just email us at partners at codeup.com. Family and friends, stay tuned to see a little bit more as our graduates reminisce on their favorite CodeUp memories and thank their supporters. A private Zoom celebration will follow these videos. Thank you everybody and have a fantastic day.